to a maple grove in 1909. Anybody here alive? <laughs> Also be relative. Does that ring a bell? Did you hear it? Kesky. K E S K E. So if you know anybody named Kesky or Sick, let me know before next Sunday. I don't have another sermon after the church sermon. Okay, let me know. Okay, let's turn to chapter 41. I apologize for this long digression here, uh, but I hope it was worthwhile. Church, uh, as we seek to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments rightly in any given culture and situation, we run into situations and problems that the church didn't confront previously, and we have to deal with it. Uh, just a footnote, too, on those individual cups. I don't know how that ever got into our church body. I think it slipped in, I'm guessing, in the early 50s or 40s, I'm thinking. You know what? Maybe, I don't know. Because I can remember um, 50 years ago when there was a big debate with the two folks about what started the church. They had the argument prior to that. So that would have been about that time at the original church, about whether or not they were going to do it or not go there. We've already proved it doesn't cost church. But I, I'm thinking, because I can never forget, Tokyo was familiar with the church. Maybe that was good. Right. I don't know. I don't think we want to force people to take unnecessary risks either. There's always a tension there. You know, I suppose how to do that. Uh, some have suggested uh, the practice of intention. You know what that is? Um, I've never encouraged that because I like to stick with what Jesus said. He didn't say take a gift, he said take a drink. So, but I don't know. I suppose we have, we do have a few members here once in a while who do that when they come up with their very sick or have open sores on their lips, so they think they're most indifferent, which I suppose is considered of your fellow members. I'm not going to condemn the practice because it wasn't condemned by Luther's day. Makes me think, though, what that story you told about the woman who was an alcoholic, uh, who, who said, you know, no, she can take the Lord's Supper because you knew that it was the blood of Christ. Well, the blood of Christ is not going to bring her. So. Well, yeah, the blood of Christ won't the wine, Mike, maybe. Perhaps, I don't know. But that brings back to the original point. I mean, how much risk we're willing to take to take the sacrament. We don't want to tempt God either, but on the other hand, I think if I go back to where I began this whole topic, if we want to go with the early church that the blood of Jesus is the medicine of immortality, maybe we should not die and live forever. Who of us should be afraid to take the sacrament? And I really have to say, when I have people questioning drinking the blood of Jesus out of the chalice, I have to ask them, do you really believe this is the blood of Jesus? Because I suspect they really don't. I think we have a problem with that in the United States because of the Protestant influence around us. Okay, chapter 41. No sin. May he add again. Um, I think I was at verse 14. Or I want to pick it up today. I was going to cover two chapters. We obviously won't. Pharaoh. Joseph is in prison. He is told the dreams of the baker and the butler. The butler being the wine steward. But they have their similar dreams about birds and about uh, a cup of wine, bread. Uh, what happens, of course, in one case, the cup is restored into the hand of Pharaoh. He drinks from it with the baker. The birds come. He's got the basket on his hand as they did in those days. The, bread, the birds eat the bread out. And of course, in that case, you'll be dead in three days. The dreams happen. Uh, the wine steward, or butler, is asked by Joseph, as you remember the story, Please remember me to Pharaoh. And of course, as is typical of many people, we're very eager to take from people, not so eager to thank them and remember. Isn't that correct? We forget to thank people. And that's, of course, typical of people. And the butler forgets all about Joseph for what? Two or three more years. He sits in prison. I imagine one day it went into a week and a week into a month and a month into two months and pretty soon he gives up and thinks, well, that ain't going to happen anymore. I guess that's the end of the story, right? Uh, he has the, uh, Pharaoh has his two dreams, very mysterious ones, about fat cows and skinny cows, and then uh, good corn, or good crops and bad crops, and he can't figure it out, and it's repeated twice, 
suggest that this thing is pretty certain. He gets very superstitious. And so he hears finding the butler reminds him, you know what, that reminds me there was a guy back in prison there who told us our dream and they helped him. Pharaoh gets all excited. Of course, that leads to the story. Verse 14, Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and brought him quickly out of the pit. Why is that word pit perhaps significant? Why does it say jail or prison? Yeah, he had been in a pit before. So here you have Joseph. And you know, you always have that kind of situation with God's people where before they come up to glory, they're always bound here. So, okay? Joseph is in the pit. And God uses Pharaoh to bring him out of the pit. And how shocked Joseph must have been as he's doing his duties. He's long since probably given up that he'll ever get out of there. When suddenly the doors, the keys go in the lock or whatever, and somebody rushes in and says, Joseph, you got to shave, you got to get ready. And the Egyptians always shave. Unlike the Hebrews, you have Hebrews. Uh, shave and change your clothes. Pharaoh's got to see he's had a dream. You've got to come in. Here. And Joseph goes. What an exciting time for him. He shaves and changes his clothes in verse 15. Um, we're going to text. I don't know where that. Okay. Pharaoh interprets to him and tells him I had a dream. No one can interpret it. Now, verse 16, Joseph very quickly responds to Pharaoh and reminds him that where does interpretation for events in the world really come from? That sentence made sense. From God. It is not my ability to interpret events. Now let's apply that to our situation today. Do we not, as the Christian church, have an obligation to interpret events in the world theologically? Yes. Yes. Whoever said that said it correctly. Yes, we do. How are we going to do that? Joseph does it by means of a vision. Uh, let's put it differently. Joseph does it by means of God's word being revealed to him. How do we interpret events in the world? By means of the word, in our case, the written word of God. And I think we need to be a lot bolder in how we do that. And perhaps this flu scare, we in the church should be using that more than we are to try to remind our society of some theological points, like, help me out here, this world is temporary, there's one important theological point, that disease and sickness, including death, they are quite random, and that nobody gets sick just because of the worst sinner than somebody else. <coughs> We're all cut from the same piece of cloth. And you never know when you will wake up tomorrow, one of your children, and have a high fever, and run the hospital. And uh, Eric and Jody Morris, of course, are going through this now with their daughter, Annalisa. And she's healthy a week or two ago, doing great. Uh, picture of health, suddenly she gets this flu business, it morphs into pneumonia, and now she's at Children's Hospital. Going back and forth, they don't know still how this thing's going to turn out. And that, or how about the shillings? Now we can have a bet like that. Does that mean that Aunt Lisa or Nathan are worse sinners than other children in our society? Absolutely not. That's an absurdity. What it does mean is that we live by the grace of God every day, one day at a time. And this life is temporary and it's fragile. We need to be like Joseph, interpreting these things for our society. There was apparently a major fire that went through St. Louis, Missouri back in the 1800s when CFW Walter, the first president of our Senate, uh, was president of the Senate, president of the seminary at that time in St. Louis. And there's a sermon recorded that he preached that following Sunday after half the city burned to the ground. And he said, this is the wrath of God on the residents of St. Louis, Missouri. That we have forsaken the truth of God's word, etc., etc. It was a tough, tough sermon. And there is a theologian taking God's word, as Joseph will do here, in a little bit different sense. But the principles are kind of the same in applying the word of God to a situation where people are puzzled, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And uh, the world always asks this question, why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? There's the big question, right? And I'll bet you there are plenty of people at uh, Children's Hospital, unlike my brother-in-law Eric and my 